Um, today, we're joined by um, Dr. Alvaro Romero Calvo. Um, he is an assistant professor at the School of Aerospace Engineering at Georgia Tech. He is a board member of ASGSR um, and served before in the AS ASGSR student board as well. And last term, he was our president. He is the vice chair of uh, the COSPAR Commission G, Material and Fluid Sciences in Space Conditions and a member of the AIAA Microgravity and Space Processes Technical Committee. Again, happy to introduce and welcome Alvaro to talk to us about low gravity fluid mechanics in the Artemis era. Take it away. Thank you, Annalisa, for the introduction. As you guys have probably already figured out, there is no way to get rid of me in ASDSR students. Uh, I was, uh, as Annalisa said before, the, the president of the Student Society, and now I'm serving at a, a different uh, part of the organization in the, in the SCSR board. Um, but well, uh, this is a, a, a society that is very close to my heart. And it is, uh, it is nice for once to be at this side of the, of the story, right? Uh, delivering the presentation. And it is also uh, an honor to, to be here with you guys. So as Annalisa mentioned, we are going to focus today on low gravity fluid mechanics. Uh, the, this second part of the sentence in the Artemis era it is referring to, to something I'm going to describe in a second, which is that uh, we are effectively changing the way we carry out fluid mechanics processes in space. And we are doing this because we are forced by the circumstances. Uh, things are changing a lot in terms of, um, sorry for that, things are changing a lot in terms of the kind of volumes, the kind of applications in, on which we apply low gravity fluid mechanics. And we need a new generation of systems to deal with those problems. Before we go to the, to the technical part of the presentation, uh, I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit from a more personal perspective. I am originally from Spain, in particular from the south of Spain, the most beautiful city in the country. If some other Spaniards tell you otherwise, don't trust them, it is Granada. Okay, So I was born there, and then I did five years of undergrad in Seville before moving to Milan for my master and then to Colorado Boulder for my BEZ. And I'm here in Atlanta, uh, leading a laboratory on, on low gravity science and technology, where we focus mainly on fluid mechanics, but not only on that, also on dust mitigation and other sort of problems. This is my office. I am now here. I was very accustomed to living in Boulder, Colorado, near the mountains in a pretty isolated region of the world. And I'm here in this huge city. And I have discovered that I actually like it very much. So if you ever want to pay us a visit at Georgia Tech, believe me, Atlanta is a city that you can really enjoy and where we have some of the best students in the world. In fact, they told us a few months ago that we were the first space engineering school in, in the US in the undergraduate program. My colleagues from other universities don't trust the rankings, but that's always what happens, right? You don't trust the rankings until they are favorable to you. In any case, uh, forget about the rankings. They don't tell anything about the schools. The important thing is that this is a cool place to do engineering, and in particular, aerospace engineering. So let me just recap a little bit about the concept of microgravity, and I know that some of you, for some of you, this will be uh, kind of basic and, and very well understood already, but some of you may be new to this, to this field. And, and for, for you, I, I want to, you know, discuss a little bit what microgravity means. You know, these images like the ones that you can see in the screen right now are, um, let's, let's say they are very common nowadays, right? Uh, and they are very common nowadays because we have gotten accustomed to uh, understanding or seeing astronauts in the, in the space station and other space vehicles, right? But when we try to understand what is happening here, things become a little bit more complicated, or at least a little bit less obvious. I was reading the other way this article in space.com, which should, I mean, space.com is a very well-known portal for space news, right? So you will expect that the journalists who work in here know reasonably well what, we're, what they are talking about. So I started reading this, microgravity in space can alter human cells. This is a space biology experiment, clearly, or a space physiology experiment. And I was reading, reading, reading until I reached this paragraph. And pay a cl close attention to this particular paragraph in here. The journalist says, uh, while space is completely free of the effect of gravity, especially immediately around Earth, this fundamental force is much weaker in orbit than on the surface of our planet. 
for instance, the effect of gravity at the International Space Station, uh, blah, 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 is 90% weaker than on terra firma. Uh, this limited gravity is described as microgravity. Well, if some of you have already, are really reasonably familiar with this field, you will know that uh, this is completely wrong. The gravity, there is one quantitative value here, which is wrong, plain wrong. wrong. At the ISS, the gravity is not 90% weaker. It is only 10% weaker. Okay, So it is almost the same. The gravity force itself is almost the same at the ISS than at the surface of the Earth. And what is happening is something completely different. I'm going to describe in a second. But let's say if everything that you can say wrong about microgravity research is summarized in this pattern. But it is not only space.com. If you go to Google, and you search for the definition of microgravity, you will find very weak gravity, as in an orbit in a spacecraft. You go one step further and ask chat GPT, you will say you will see that I mean the, the solution is a bit better, but it is not really there yet. Uh, they say something like um, the gravitational pull of an object is significantly lower than that experience on the Earth. That is wrong. It has nothing to do with the gravitational pull. Microgravity as According to the, to the real definition, it's a state on which people or objects are in simultaneous free fall with relative accelerations of the order of 10 to the minus 6 g0. This is completely different from the previous definitions, because in the previous definitions, they always imply that the gravity force is very weak. It is not that the word gravity force is very weak. And what is weak is the relative acceleration between two bodies. So imagine that you are uh, on an elevator with an apple in your hand, and suddenly someone cuts the rope of the elevator. As the apple and you fall inside the elevator, with respect to an external observer like this technician in here, the apple and you are going to fall with more or less the same acceleration. However, the acceleration of the apple with respect to you is going to be very close to zero. How close to zero determines, um, I mean, the, the, the value of this residual acceleration is what determines the quality of your microgravity conditions. But that's a different story. This is the definition of microgravity. It has nothing to do with a weak gravity force. Okay, you can have microgravity in a hundred Gs at the surface or whatever planet it has a hundred Gs. <laughs> I don't remember. So if we clarify this, then the next question for this talk is: Okay, how does this condition influence the behavior of fluids, and in particular of multiphase flows in microgravity? In order to explain this, I always uh, take this example from Samantha Cristoforetti, the Italian astronaut at the International Space Station. Let me tell you a story. When Don Petit, the NASA astronaut, went uh, to space, I don't know if it was in his first trip, but it was I mean, one of them for sure, he took a foil of, um, of a transparent plastic, right, and folded it over itself, generating what we call a conduit geometry. A conduit geometry or, or a wedge geometry is no more than two planes that intersect each other. And the beautiful part uh, of it is that surface tension, which is one of the basic or most important force in, in space conditions, it holds the liquid to that corner of the, of, the, of the system, right? You can exploit that effect to hold liquids in a space. And the reason why we care about that is that when you try to drink coffee in a space, you are actually interested in smelling the coffee, right? A big part of the pleasure of drinking coffee comes from the from the from the smell of it, not from the taste. The taste of coffee is actually pretty bad if you think about it. But if you drink coffee on a plastic bag, you are killing all the smell of coffee, unfortunately. So what Don Petit wanted to do first, and then Marcus Logel, was to develop a system where you could smell coffee and at the same time drink it. In order to develop this system, what they did was creating this interface here. It is a wedge geometry as the one I was describing before. This was developed by Mark Bislogel at Portland State University. The basic idea is that you pour the coffee in here and the coffee, as you can see in this image, remains at the corner of, the, of your little cup or your little coffee cup. Now, the question that I always ask my students is what happens if instead of coffee, you have champagne in this place or any other um, carbonated beverage, right? Like any other soft drink. Well, what will happen is that bubbles are going to start being generated inside the system, eventually bringing the liquid away of it, just because they are expanding the volume, the volume, right? You are basically generating a foam instead of a liquid coffee. So, and, and this is a very silly example. And you may think, OK, what is this guy talking about? What do we care about coffee, a champagne, or Coca-Cola in a space, for, 
give you a couple of examples. Uh, well, because this behavior of uh, multi-phase flows of bubbles in a space actually influences a lot of critical applications. For instance, electrolysis. This is a centrifuge like the ones that we implement in an electrolytic system in a in life support system of the International Space Station. We use these centrifuges to remove bubbles from liquids to extract, in that particular case, gases like hydrogen and oxygen. But also capillary forces are extremely important for plant watering and biological experiment. This is a picture from the Pond system, which was co-sponsored by Tupperware, if I don't remember, if I remember well. So capillary forces and the intricate balance between a bubbles and liquids and multi-phase flows in microgravity are central to a wide variety of space technologies. Um, one of my friends uh, said this in a very beautiful way. It, he said that people are not conscious of the importance of fluids for a wide variety of, of space technologies that work thanks to them. If we don't have a nice fluid management system in place for many space technologies, we will not simply fly, right? So, and that happens, and as I mentioned before, that is happening right now. And that is an important aspect right now, because in the Artemis era, we are pushing the limits of what has been done until now in low gravity fluid mechanics. The SLS is the largest rocket we have ever launched, the largest launcher we have ever launched to space. The propellant tanks of this uh, rocket are huge. They uh, have hydrogen and oxygen in liquid state. Those are cryogenics. Managing cryogenics, as, as we know very well, is very complicated on Earth. But in microgravity, managing cryogenics is almost a, a nightmare, or it is a complete nightmare, because cryogenics tend to boil off and tend to, tend to leak uh, through the propellant tanks and through the valves of your system. Le refueling cryogenics in orbit, as a starship is planning to do, has not been solved yet. Elon Musk keeps saying that he wants to send people to Mars and he's going to do this refueling strategy uh, on Earth orbit before sending the Starship to, to Mars. Well, good luck with that. We still don't have the technology to do cryogenic refueling. And there are so many problems from the heat transfer perspective that we won't have that technology at least for the next 10 years. Okay, there are companies like um, um, ETA Space that have developed the technology demonstrators like LogSat it is still in a very early stage of development. But the problem here is that if we really want to get to Mars, a strategy like the one that SpaceX is exploring, I mean, refueling that spacecraft in orbit, actually makes a lot of sense. So we need to solve this problem. If we go from the big scale of a rocket like this, which have, has many other problems like propellant sloshing, to another scale, the scale of CubeSats, which are much smaller, then what we find are other sort of problems. Managing propellants in conformal tanks that are not spherical or cylindrical, but that are, have a square geometry, right? So do, solving these problems is not trivial. It's a beautiful challenge, but right? it's not trivial. And we have not really solved them. But if we want to send propel a spacecraft to orbit, and we want to do that with a minimum reasonably efficiency, we need to address those challenges. So that's what my laboratory is doing. From a more general perspective, what my guys and I are doing is Expanding the traditional definition of low gravity fluid mechanics that considers inertial and capillary, capillary forces like a, a centrifuge or a, a vein geometry like the one I described before to include other sort of interactions that have been known for a long time but not really exploited from a technical or even scientific perspective. Those three interactions are magnetohydrodynamics, hydroacoustics, and electrohydrodynamics. We cover all the fundamentals of this in terms of interfaces, numerical capabilities, multi-phase flows. But as engineers, we really care about the applications. And today, I want to talk about three of those applications that in this context of innovation and, and vast or, or very fast change um, are, fit very well into this whole philosophy of trying to expand the kind of toolbox that we have for uh, the microarray research. So today, I'm going to talk about phase separation, electrolysis, and propellant management. This is what um, we're going to uh, discuss right now. And let's start with the simplest of them, magnetic phase separation. This was a paper that my colleagues and I from the University uh, of Warwick um, published uh, a couple months ago. Before we start with this, let me tell you, let me disclose something that maybe is not so familiar to some of you, which is that everything is magnetic. A block of uh, wood is magnetic. It's a diamagnetic material. Water itself is another diamagnetic material. This is a nice video from the Action Lab. The link is here at the bottom of the slide, uh, where this guy takes the, this little magnet in here, where well, it is not too little. This is a pretty dangerous magnet. 
and he pushes this block of wood above the water. You can see how the magnet is effectively generating a very weak propulsive force. The same happens with us. Okay, so humans are also bodies of water. And when I say humans, I say frogs, I say grasshoppers, I say fruits, I say vegetables. Okay, this is a little frog inside a huge toroidal magnet that is generating a force that compensates for gravity. So this frog is being levitated at the point where the magnetic force and the gravity force compensate each other. You can see how you reach weightless, weightlessness conditions, like microgravity conditions in here. It's a pretty cool video. And we can do this because these um, insects and, and animals are effectively diamagnetic. Okay, if you apply a very strong magnetic force to a diamagnetic material, the diamagnetic material will tend to go away from it. Of course, when you do this on Earth, the force that you need is huge. You need a huge toroidal or even, or even superconductor magnet. When you try to do this in space, something different happens. And that is what we tested a couple months ago in this paper, Magnetic Phase Separation and Microgravity. It is no longer in press. This has been published. Sorry, this is not updated. But the basic idea that we explored was, OK, let's exploit the diamagnetic force to do something useful for space applications. So let's put a magnet near a syringe uh, loaded with a sample, the sample can be water, it can be LB broth, can be, a, uh, sorry, a lot olive oil, like in this case, whatever you can imagine. So we inject the gas bubbles in here of air and we let them flow freely under the action of the magnet. What we compute uh, from numerical models is that the acceleration of this uh, bubble of, uh, sorry, the acceleration imposed by the magnet on the liquid is going to be between one and a hundred millimeters per second square. You may think that is ridiculous, but the truth is this acceleration is huge for a microgravity environment. You can effectively change the behavior of liquids with this. Same with the terminal bubble velocity or the steady state bubble velocity that we get with a one millimeter diameter bubble out of here. The bubbles will move between 0, 0,1 to 10 millimeters per second, which again is very significant. So we take all the systems and we drop it in this facility here. This is a drop tower that is located in Bremen. The fundamental principle is to have a free fall condition, right? So you catapult a capsule from the bottom. You will see this in a second. The experiment is in this capsule. And as the experiment goes up and down around this tower in here, the, whatever is inside the capsule will experience microgravity conditions. Again, notice the important thing here is the relative acceleration, not the absolute acceleration. This capsule is subject to gravity conditions, subject to the full gravity pull of Earth. but while this capsule is going up and down, there will be a, a, a microgravity condition being generated inside for everything that is free floating with it. So we launch our syringes in here uh, for 9.4 seconds and see what happens. And well, actually, this, this was a 4.3, not, not 9.6 seconds, it doesn't really matter. But well, look at what happens. We inject the bubbles in this chamber, and the magnet is pulling the bubbles towards, towards itself when the liquid is dielectric, like LB broth, water, or olive oil. When the liquid is paramagnetic, the behavior is the opposite. The liquid feels attractive towards the magnet, and the bubbles go away from it. And that is exactly what you see in these two videos at the bottom. So yeah, this is a very interesting fundamental uh, science concept. But the most, in my opinion as an engineer, the most interesting aspect of this is that you can exploit this to induce phase separation in microgravity. For instance, I assume that some of you may be working on biological sciences. When you try to operate a Petri dish in microgravity, bubbles are generated at the interfaces, and it's very, very, very hard to get them out of the system. You could use a simple magnet like this one to move the bubbles from one place to the other and ensure that your sample is gas-free. Of course, we did a lot of uh, engineering analysis of this problem. We tracked the position of the bubbles and computed their speed and came up with these two terminal bubble velocity formulations for our system. In the end, we were able to compare the velocity of the bubbles as a function of the horizontal magnetic force, or the force around this axis here, um, with respect to the analytical formulations. And the agreement is pretty consistent. It's pretty solid. Uh, and there is a difference in here because you need to account for the non-steady state conditions. But uh, beyond this, from a technical perspective, this was a very successful, simple, and very impactful experiment. In fact, uh, people like it so much that um, Tatiana Woodwell, Woodall sorry, wrote this nice article in Popular Science about our work that you can go check. It is a very fun read. And she, she, did, uh, she wrote down a very 
uh, accurate description of, of the experiment from a very you know low level from very high level perspective of course and a very divulgative perspective but you know emphasizing all the key aspects so there it is a go there and check it if you're interested this was phase separation as i said that is the most fundamental application because um, well it is the it covers the most general case of, of um, phase separation that we can exploit using these new forces but there are many more and probably the most interesting application for me right now is low gravity electrolysis or i would better say water electrolysis now water electrolysis is a fundamental component of every life support system when humans are in a space they are encapsulated in an atmosphere uh, that is generated artificially inside a space right and what you try to do in that atmosphere is take the CO2 that we breathe out, right, and convert it somehow to oxygen so that we can breathe in that oxygen, right, and, and continue the cycle inside the spacecraft, in a, ideally in a closed loop system. At the ISS, that is done with a water electrolysis system that splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen right now is vented, but in the future it will be recycled too, and the oxygen goes to the atmosphere. Then we, to recycle the carbon dioxide, we use a Sabatier reactor, which is a very high energy in, or energy intensive uh, mechanism. But we're not, we're not going to cover that right now. The important thing here is that the water that we expel from our body uh, in different forms <laughs> uh, is eventually electrolyzed to get oxygen out of that. But um, there is a surprise uh, factor in here, which is in space engineering, we look for reliability. Safety in human spaceflight is a design parameter. And this may be shocking for some of you because we, of course, we try to, to keep our astronauts safe, but it's not the same keeping someone safe with a 10% probability of failure than keeping someone safe with a 1% or a 0.1% probability of failure, right? The cost, the mass, the power that you require for those three different levels is gonna be drastically different. Turns out that if you try to use the same oxygen generation assembly that we have at the International Space Station on a trip to Mars, which is about six months uh, on every leg of the trip, what you will end up um, facing is a problem, which is that the oxygen generation assembly is not sufficiently reliable for the trip. You will need so many spares that, <laughs> pay attention to this, it is even more efficient to store all the oxygen in a tank and release it slowly as the trip goes on rather than recycling the whole cabin atmosphere. I don't know how many of you are engineers, but for me, A, that was a shocking conclusion, and B, it was a nightmare in the sense of, uh, okay, if you want to design a, a, an engineering uh, approach to this problem, you don't just store oxygen in a propellant tank, right? It, is, it sounds like a very bad solution. It's contradictory that the best systems that we have out there in the space right now, which look like this, are not able to provide the reliability levels that we need to bring humans to Mars. And there is one very uh, intimate reason or a very deep reason why this happens. If you take a look at the oxygen generation assembly, which is this part over here, but also to any other part of the system, you will see that this device has many pumps. This is a rotary phase separator. It has many pumps in here, many connections between different parts of the assembly. If you take a look at the EMIAC machine or the first one of the first computers in history, the EMIAC look more or less like this. So when I was a really a PhD student, I took a look at this picture and thought, is there a better way of doing this that doesn't have so many complications? Well, the underlying problem behind all this is that you need to separate gases from liquids. Remember the coffee mat I talked about before. Right? If you want to separate uh, gases from liquids, particularly when those gases are um, in the form of a bubble, there are not many options nowadays. The only option you have is a centrifuge. If you don't separate that, if you just let your electrolyzer to generate bubbles in microgravity inside an electrolyte or in a proton exchange membrane, in any other sort of mechanism that extracts gases from water, right, hydrogen and oxygen, what will happen is something like this. The gases will accumulate over the electrodes, shielding them and generating a foam layer. So yeah, the centrifuge right now is necessary. But says, again, when I was already a PhD student, I thought, is there a better way of doing this? Can we remove all this complication, all this water recirculation loop that essentially adds so much mass and power consumption and reduces the reliability of your system? And I conceptualized two different strategies. The first one was the diamagnetic approach. So remember the syringe and the bubbles? It is the same. The only thing is that in this case, instead of injecting the bubbles with a syringe, we generate the bubbles over the surface of an electrode. 
uh, this uh, think about this like the high school experiments where you take two pieces of metal and put them inside of a, of a solution with uh, water and salt right um that is the it is the same mechanism so instead of generating the bubbles via uh, uh, any sort of syringe we're generating them on the surface of an electrolyzer and then we're going to apply the same mechanism as before to pull the bubbles out of the system and separate them the advantage of this approach is that it has, it has no moving parts, okay? So you don't need centrifuges or anything like that. We are currently flying this and testing this kind of approach. It is not, the main complication is detaching the bubbles from the surface of this electrode because surface tension is keeping them in place. But we are working on that. The second approach is called the magnetohydrodynamic drive. If you watch this movie from the 1990s called The Hunt for Red October, they talk about a nuclear submarine, a Soviet nuclear submarine that is propelled by magneto hydrodynamics. Well, the same concept applies here. The magneto hydrodynamic approach is not feasible on Earth because the conductivity of the ocean seawater is very, very low. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons, right? But in a space, that weak force can have a huge effect on your system. And that's what we are exploiting right now. We have several patterns on this concept. The idea is that you have a, a current between two electrodes and a magnetic field applied to it. And if you remember uh, your physics course, a current or a charge moving in a space plus a magnetic field or times a magnetic field means a Lorentz force. So all this liquid is going to start flowing and convecting around because of that Lorentz force. And that is the mechanism that we are exploiting in our system. I cannot share a lot of information yet about this because it is under publication and under review, but I can share some one of the experiments that we have already discussed thoroughly in our conference. And that experiment was carried out uh, at the um, Blue Origin New Cephar Suborbital Rocket. It was sponsored by, by ASDSR through the Ken Sosa 2020 Space Flight Program. And what they gave us is this little two unit payload that weighs half a kilogram and goes inside the New Cephar capsule, which is here. So you put the little thing in there and mount it on a rocket, and bring it to the uh, about 100, 110 kilometers above the ground. And at that point, the booster of the rocket shuts off, right? Um, and at that point, you have almost perfect microgravity conditions for something like three to six minutes, depending on the configuration. So yeah, we developed an experiment to test some of these technologies. The idea we came up with was this. So we have an electrolytic cell in here. This is a chamber filled with an electrolyte, a water-based electrolyte, which is neutral and non-toxic, non-harmful. Non and we expose this electrolyte to the magnetic force induced by two magnets, which are here. These magnets are going to have two effects on the fluid. The first, is, the first one is a diamagnetic acceleration. This diamagnetic acceleration is going to pull the bubbles in the same way I showed before with the syringes. So nothing more, nothing new about this. This is a, a 2D map, by the way, like a cut of the system. So you have your electrodes in here, and the bubbles are going to be pulled away by the magnet. And to them, it is cool. There is a second uh, effect happening here, which is the Lorentz acceleration, or the magnetohydrodynamic approach, which means that uh, over the surface of the electrode, when there is a current flowing through them, the Lorentz force is going to induce a convective magnetohydrodynamic motion of the liquid. So think of it as, as um, a problem of physics, right? The charges are moving around. When they move in the presence of this magnetic field produced by these powerful magnets, the liquid starts moving around. Actually, we had the chance of testing this. So this is how the experiment looked like before integration. Uh, this is our cell. This is a control, a control cell that we use just to compare it. it. You always include a control in your system, right? And this is what happened not at the Blue Origin New Cephar. This is what happened at the drop tower of Bremen, the same facility I showed you before. So the experiment starts. And here, here you find the, the electrodes. And hydrogen and oxygen is being generated over there. See the bubbles in here? They're very tiny. But uh, yeah, so they start flowing around. If the magnets were not here, you will see no movement whatsoever. But look at this beautiful pattern in here. The bubbles are just moving towards the magnets. Uh, and also here at the bottom, you see how uh, these bubbles are spinning because that is being induced by the Lorentz force. But they are also uh, flowing slowly through, towards the points of, of high magnetic field intensity. So yeah, we got the first verification that this system could work in a very low TRL uh, technology approach, which you can see here. Now we are working on implementing this on a real scale system. So we plan to fly again uh, very soon uh, and fly in a new new safer flight, hopefully next year or the next one. We'll see um, through the tech flight proposal solicitation. We'll work on that. Uh, but this is the fundamental idea. These are the fundamental forces that we have here. 
we can move bubbles in microgravity if we are very careful about the magnetic configuration of the system we can redirect those bubbles towards specific points where we want to accumulate them that's the key takeaway from this slide uh, when we flew this in the new cfr 23 mission which i don't know you're familiar with i, I was here in the middle of the desert uh, so this happened this was last summer last september if you check the news so we took off nicely and uh, it was a, a beautiful sight from the desert in in, in texas and the long side of, of blue origin and what everything seems to go nominal but at some point let me advance this video a little bit some point something happened it was a bit scary <laughs> it, it was it was a uh, fascinating to watch too so we were there in the middle of the desert and let's give it a minute there we go so we're there and this happened there was a blue Origin release a communicate uh, sorry a, a press release um, very recently what happened was that the nozzle of the rocket of the booster uh, had a mechanical failure due to thermal loads and fatigue and basically the, the capsule started the is the uh, and then let me remember the name of this the safety mode or the the capsule recovery mechanism so this thing has some as you can see here it has some some thrusters that bring the capsule out of the way this is nothing new if you check the sls the sls has similar thrusters at the top solid rocket engines that bring the capsule out of the way of the booster so that whatever is inside either humans or payloads like mine do not suffer from uh, this uh, failure of, of the booster right and i have to say that i mean of course everyone was a bit upset because the experiment was not completed as expected and the blue origin employees were of course more upset than everyone because you know it is their baby so they want to take good care of it but it was amazing to see that this beautiful safety mechanism work as it was expected to work right you can see here the parachutes being de deployed everything went according to plan and in fact the payload is sitting in my office right now waiting for a future reply so good job blue origin folks uh, this was a, a a very nice demonstration of a safety recovery mechanism and for me it was a real honor to to be there on site because nowadays in the 21st century you don't get to see many rocket failures and you don't get to see many of nominal conditions out there right um this was a, a one of the most beautiful experiences i have ever had as an engineer uh, from the let's say comic side uh, someone on Twitter <laughs> posted this. Of course, this was a, an unmanned flight, so there was nobody on board. But someone uh, uh, recovered this uh, picture from the Looney Tunes and uh, posted this on Twitter, which I found hilarious. Right? Oh well. Beyond this, uh, it was a very fun experience. The third and final application I want to discuss now is actually being led by my student Samuel Hart um, at the at Georgia Tech. He's, uh, I'm co-advising him together with, with Professor. Glenn Lightsey from the Space Systems Design Laboratory. And uh, what he's doing is exploring new methods to control propellant positions in CubeSats. As I mentioned before, CubeSats are one of the new elements, one of the new actors of the decent new space age, right? CubeSats are a small shoebox size spacecraft that have, um, you know, a very limited space, but can be very powerful if you devote sufficient attention and resources to their design, right? You can take very cool pictures of the Earth, very nice measurements of the radiation environment, and etc. One of the big problems with CubeSat is that we want to propel them. But there are many, many limitations with this. For instance, one limitation is that CubeSats can only be pressurized up to 150 bars. Why? Well, because CubeSats are secondary payloads of, of other rocket launches, right? So you don't want a secondary payload to screw up a $1 billion mission, like, for instance, James Webb or any other a telescope or, or big satellite, right? So everything has to be inherently safe, which means low pressures in the combustion chamber, low pressures in the propellant tanks, and the propellant has to be very, very safe. Uh, for instance, you can propel a cube cell with water, right? Just by vaporizing water or by electrolyzing water, as we just discovered. Or you can use a refrigerant, uh, what we call a cold gas thruster. In any case, you cannot put in here something, or usually you cannot put in here something like hydrazine, right? Um, because hydrazine is toxic and, and highly um, corrosive, and, and there are many, many uh, safety concerns with hydrazine at many levels. Also, these spacecraft are designed usually by universities, which limits a lot the, of the technical resources that you can implement on them. The problem with fluid mechanics and CubeSats is new. So you want to propel the system because you can significantly enhance the capability of your mission. But in order to control the position of propellants in this CubeSat geometry, you need to adapt 
to the limited space. So we come up usually with what we call conformal tank geometries, right? Though these conformal tank geometries are no more than a square boxes with corners. Remember the coffee mug? Well, the problem here is the same. These corners of this uh, propellant tank are going to attract the liquid, are going to suck the liquid there. So it's very, very, very hard to control the position of this system. In fact, these are just simulations in surface evolver done by my students. He um, computed what would happen with the liquid, with the gas bubble of the liquid, which is represented here in blue and, and orange, as uh, the acceleration increases or decreases. So if you are in a no acceleration environment, the bubble is going to take this shape. If you start thrusting your spacecraft with the thruster, which is here at the bottom, the bubble will eventually move up, right? So the, the thing here is think about this problem. You want to get gas out of your system because this is a cold gas thruster, right? What do you do in there? But we don't know what this is. We implement a second chamber where we take any residuals from liquid and expand them or even heat them up to increase the pressure, right? But that's not a really nice solution because you're wasting a lot of volume in that way, up to a 20, 25% of the volume. So 20, 25% of your lifetime of the, of the mission lifetime is going to be wasted with that approach. So we were thinking, okay, is there any other way to get the gas out of the system? If you run this uh, surface of water simulations, you will get this equilibrium position. And you may think, well, if you want to get gas out of here, the only thing you need to do is to put a probe or an outlet just right here in the middle of the bubble, right? But that's not exactly right, because uh, when you have very low a very small thrust level applied to this, this bubble is going to displace to the top. So suddenly, what was a nice position for getting only gas out of your system becomes a liquid-filled environment. Same with many other configurations. In other words, we need to find a way to position this propeller and get only gas out of the system without the need of an expansion chamber that takes about 20-25% of the volume. So my student and I started thinking about this problem. And the first idea is, OK, well, let's use capillary propeller management devices. Capillary propeller management devices are no more than veins uh, like this or, or surfaces that attract the liquid right, and br bring them to a certain position. But the problem with capillary PMDs for this particular application is that, yes, they can hold the liquid. But remember, remember, this is a saturated mixture. So as soon as you start having bubbles, the bubbles most likely are going to remain attached to these uh, PMDs. right? And if not, they're going to take a long time to detach and go to the surface once you are thrusting. Another problem is that if you are unlucky and this gas bubble goes to this part of the spacecraft, for instance, when you start, um, um, when you release the CubeSat, right, with the deployment mechanism, the gas bubble is going to remain in here and you're really not going to have the ability to move the bubble to the outlet of the tank. Not easily, at least. In fact, if you have a small bubbles, and unless the small bubbles touch both walls of the capillary PMD, they're not going to move from the place where they are located. So this is not really an nice solution. There is another problem. Imagine an ideal situation where this bubble is here. Well, as the gas starts vaporizing and the bubbles start being generated everywhere around the tank, those bubbles are going to go to the surface, are going to rupture, and that rupture is going to release more bubbles and more small droplets that are going to basically suck through the outlet. So yeah, this is not a nice, efficient mechanism that we can employ for cubes, not for conformal tank geometries, for sure, and not for saturated propellant mixtures, like a refrigerant, like the kind of refrigerant that you have in your fridges. So the first idea we had is, OK, let's use the magnet, right? Because the refrigerant is going to be diamagnetic. So the magnet is going to keep the bubble nice in there. And you're just going to you know, release the bubbles as they go. And that's going to be fine. And also, if there are any bubbles flying around, the magnet is going to pull them away. Well, it is not such a great idea. Why? Because we need, uh, as I indicated before I didn't, and, and didn't say, we not only need to operate the system, we also need to reorient. Those are the two thrusts that we need to explore. So, OK, the bubble is here and everything works reasonably OK. But if the bubble originally is here, then you have a problem because the magnet force decays very quickly. And it is not possible to pull a bubble from this side of the tank to this other side of the tank. So yeah, this system would not work very nicely if the bubble was really there, but not if the bubble is not located there. Or in other words, we don't have the capability to reorient the property. With the direct property design, what we are applying is the same kind of force we apply with the magnet, but with electric fields. So we apply a relatively high potential difference between wires that hold the liquid in place to expel the bubble. It's like a capillary PMD, but much lighter. Again, we are facing some concerns here, because if the bubble is not located at this side of the tank, it's very, very hard to move them only with diatrophoretic forces. It is not impossible. It depends on the geometry. Depending on the geometry, even with a small bubbles, you can do that. But not all geometries work very well for diatrophoretic systems. 
So well, uh, what do we do? Well, Sam came up with this wonderful idea, which is okay. If we have a saturated with propellant mixture or like a refrigerant, right? Like any sort of xenon gas or RF gas or whatever, um, well, the only thing we need to do is to heat it up, right? Because if we heat up this liquid, the liquid, since it is saturated just at the vapor pressure, it's gonna transform itself into gas. So you're gonna expand the liquid at one part of the tank and compress the liquid at the other side. So you effectively can reorient the propellant and get the gas out of the system with this sort of heater. And you don't need any sort of uh, expansion chamber for this. The only thing you need is a heater and a magnet. And you need the magnet because you need to keep this bubble in place. As the heater operates, the bubble is generated and you have multiple bubbles in there. In our experiments, we have shown that those gas bubbles coalesce very well when they are exposed to the uh, energy of a magnet, to the magnetic force of, the, of a magnet. So yeah, this is the system we are setting in right now. We have a patent on it as well. And it, we are starting the testing probably <laughs> next week. It's very, very exciting because this is a problem that nobody has really been able to solve efficiently. And that is going to be very important for the future of CubeSat exploration, right? So we are very, very excited to see what happens with our lab. And it is already 12.45, so I'm going to be concluding here. The last remark I wanted to make is that microarray research is cool, it's fun, okay? In these two pictures, you see a, me here. This is when I was a, a micro, not a microarray student, sorry. I, I was an undergraduate student uh, studying microgravity. So I was here, I'm 21, 22 years old. And these are my colleagues from Politecnico de Milano. This is our professor, Filippo Maggi, from, from there in the Space Propulsion Laboratory and all our colleagues from Samsung Tower and NOSA who sponsor our experiment. Uh, by the way, if you want to access um, microgravity facilities and you are in any place in the world, you can apply through UNOSA to get access to these to this wonderful um, facilities like uh, the Drop Tower of Bremen or uh, Parabolic Flights or many, many others. So yeah, for me, this was a life-changing experience because suddenly I was leading my own, I, I was leading my own research experiment, right? with. Uh, with um, an amazing team of people and a, an outstanding microgravity facility. It was um, one of the most rewarding experiences uh, that I had as undergrad and master student. Then uh, as part of ASDSR, I joined these guys to go to the Hill and advocate for microgravity research uh, with Congress staffers and, and you know talk about what we do and so on. So this field has a lot of potential. If you really want to dwell into space engineering, you can design and fly an experiment in less than six months if you want to. If you want to send a spacecraft, you may wait between years to decades, right? In microarray research, you don't need to wait. You can fly something in, in months to, to just a couple of years and you will learn a lot and you will uh, lead a whole space project. So that is one of the beautiful things about this, this field. You can do a lot with very limited resources and you can learn a lot about nature and about space engineering. So if you ever have the chance or want more information, please reach out to me. This is the website of my lab at Georgia Tech. You take your phones and, uh, and take a picture of this, it will get you there where we describe all our work and you have all my contact information here. I didn't include my email here, but this is my, on my website. So just go there and, and check it and reach out if you have any questions. And with this, I conclude. Now, if you have anything you want to talk about or discuss, I will be more than happy to, to do it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll open the floor to questions. Um, you can also... Uh, put your questions in the chat and I can read it, um, whatever is comfortable, but um, I'll get us started here. So for bubble formation, that is also dependent on, you know, your material properties, mm -hmm. like spe especially surfaces. So with materials that have hydrophobic surface, they tend to be aerophilic. Mm -hmm. And from your studies, um, do you think that the magnet is sufficient enough to break that barrier? That, that's a, 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 an, an excellent question. Yeah, indeed. And not only not only from the uh, surface tension perspective, but also from the nucleation perspective, right? You have yeah. uh, you have your pan and you scratch the pan in, in your kitchen, right? Or, or, or your boiler, you start boiling water, you will see that water starts boiling in there, right? So, yep. and that is a consequence of the nucleation spots that, that are uh, appearing in that scenario. Yes. Uh, surface tension in there, the, the, the fact that surface tension is holding things there, particularly for aero, aerophilic surfaces, is a problem. If you want to release bubbles and use them in, a, in an electrolytic cell, either you crank up the voltage for um, a direct for this instance, for instance, or you adopt um, aerophobic surfaces or highly hydro, hydrophilic surfaces. 
you need you need to play a little bit with surface engineering to make that system work. But that's that's exactly what we are dealing with right now. So how can we manufacture electrodes that are hydrophilic? And our partners have already done uh, something like this. So yeah, we are. It is a, a a current area of research. But so far the positives are the, the results are very positive. Sorry. So, so yeah, but it is a key question indeed. All right. Thank you. Um, we have one from Ishan. From space business point of view, what are the possibilities? Well, we have already three, four patents on this, and we're working with a variety of companies on, on developing these technologies. Right? Uh, think about this. Uh, the whole uh, presumption that humans can fly in space, can go to space, is based on a variety of fluid mechanic processes that we don't really understand yet and we haven't mastered, which means that the more uh, space activity we have, the more we will need technologies like this. Axiom, Blue Origin, uh, Sierra are building uh, space stations for NASA right now, uh, for uh, private space stations. How are you going to drink a cup of coffee in space? Right? How are you going to celebrate uh, your birthday in space if you cannot drink champagne? Right? So uh, there are many more complications associated with drinking champagne in space. For starters, the expansion of bubbles in your stomach. But you know, it's just a silly example. There are many, many, many things happening right now. Elon Musk wants to send a Starship to Mars. OK, cool. But you haven't really solved the problem for refueling cryogenics. Until we solve the problem, uh, all of this is hypothetical, right? So there are many, many, many things that we need to, to, to explore in here, and many companies pursuing this. So right now, the space sector is, is moving to a more um, a private environment where uh, basically you, you need to satisfy the, this sort of very fundamental demands, right? So my perspective right now is that there is a big market out there and that we should exploit as, as academics, in my case, or that we can exploit in a variety of situations. And of course, that is very interesting from a, from a business point of view. Uh, for my case as an academic, but also for anyone getting into space right now and trying to do something for NASA or for other space actors. Chris says, thank you for your time to present this informative talk on fluid mechanics in microgravity. His question is, would it be wise and more efficient to create and transport a biome habitat um, gardens for fuel, food, water? instead of man-made mechanical structures, valves, et cetera. That is autonomous, self-regulating of resources before sending humans to Mars. That way, food, environment, and materials or biomaterials are adapted when you, humans arrive. I, I love this question. Uh, you know, I teach space systems design at Georgia Tech, and one of, one of, our, of our lectures is about life support in space. So we talk about this, we talk about creating um, biospheres in space, right? Which is a very old concept. It dates back to the beginning of the century or even earlier, right? Everyone has been thinking about having uh, biospheres in space. The problem with biosphere is that, uh, at least from the engineering perspective, or let's say from the more traditional uh, life support perspective, humans are an element inside an ecosystem, right? And that ecosystem, it, if it is made of valves and, and, and you know, electrolyzers and life support mechanisms is something we can really control. But a plant, a bi a, 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 not a mechanism, but an animal or, or a plant can uh, are effectively a black box, right? They're extremely complex mechanisms that we don't really understand. And we don't really know in most cases how those mechanisms are gonna behave under the stresses of not only microgravity, but also radiation or lack of biodiversity, right? Or, or a very particular climate. There is a book that I, reach out here in a second. There's this one, uh, Far Beyond the Moon. It is a book that I recommend my students, uh, uh, to my students uh, during the class. Uh, it talks about this sort of, this particular sort of problem. So how can we generate a biosphere in space? And what have we done so far to generate this biosphere? You will see very quickly in the book that there are many, many complications with this. Uh, one of them, for a very silly one, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of algae, atmospheric recycling, right? I guess that you have a tank with algae in there and you inject carbon dioxide and get oxygen out of the system. Well, there have been experiments with this sort of approach where astronauts enter an atmosphere that was completely regulated by algae and they became extremely dizzy and, and completely sick after a very short period of time just because of the smell of algae, right? There are many, many things we don't really understand about how to make that happen. But I agree with you that in the future, if we really want to have a sustainable presence in the space, 
we would need something like that. And in fact, there are current efforts addressing that problem. For instance, there is this concept, this European concept called MELISA uh, for a life support, a, continue, a com completely bio life support system in space for, the, for a lunar environment. And there are many papers out there about MELISA. It is a beautiful, a beautiful concept, a beautiful approach. It can be done. It requires a ton of power, particularly for plant lighting. But uh, conceptually, it can be done. And in the future, maybe in 100 years, in 200 years, I would expect that to be the norm of uh, space exploration rather than the exception. And in fact, at the, at the International Space Station, we have many plant biology experiments. Astronauts are growing uh, lettuce and many other plants for uh, human consumption because they want to supplement their vitamins, right? So maybe building the whole ecosystem is not feasible, but what we are doing right now is to complement our, our diet with you know, it's, it's small things that we can grow in the space and that provide those nutrients that we need. So a fascinating topic. Thank you for the question. But uh, we still have a, a long path to go before that becomes a reality. Thank you. Um, so I have one more question. So mm -hmm. when you implemented the heater with the magnet, um, it, like I guess like the the natural reaction would be that heat will reduce the magnetic force so is there um I guess can you talk more about what like how did you guys mitigate that or maybe it doesn't affect it at all maybe well I, I think you have that idea because you have you have probably heard before about the Curie point so permanent magnets become demagnetized when you hit them up uh, until the Curie point, which is about, uh, uh, thanks Craig for the link. Uh, it is about uh, 700 Celsius for permanent magnets, right? But we don't get, we don't reach that, that temperature at all. You, you need to consider that this mixture is saturated, right? So the gas liquid phases are, are there in a very unstable equilibrium, right? The gas has been converted into liquid at the same rate that the liquid is converted into gas. So as soon as you apply a tiny heat contribution, that you're going to break that balance and, and you're going to start generating bubbles where you need them to be generated. And that is the beauty of this approach. That is why, uh, that is why it works so well, right? Because we are really there. It is just it is like um, one of those um, toys where there is a balance that's moving like this. I don't know what's the, the English name for that. So the system is like, is like this. You just need to apply a tiny force to shift it whenever you want, uh, whatever you want. It's a very unstable equilibrium in that sense. So it, it doesn't affect the magnetic field, really. Gotcha. Thank you. Welcome. I think we have about four more minutes or something. So if anyone wants to ask um, questions, I'll give it like a minute for anyone. But otherwise, um, we can end the webinar if there's no questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like we don't have more questions. Well, guys, it has been my pleasure. Thank you so much, Annalisa and ACSR team again for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to, to participate with your activities. Thank you for giving this awesome webinar. Um, for anybody, um, just for information, this will be recorded if you missed something or if you want to share it with a colleague um, because of in, in, important information, um, this will be uploaded hopefully by tonight or tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for attending. Goodbye.